so uh, it is time for us to uh, uh, to, uh, to start our meeting. I see uh, we're all all here on the screen. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, call this meeting to order for uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee, Thursday, February fourth, twenty twenty one. Chair statement, Republic hearing for OP and zoning items. This is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed as item three on today's agenda. For the item just mentioned, only those who make oral submission today or written submission before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local plan tribunal, uh, appeal tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of recipient of the application for a zoning and 120 days for an official plan amendment. To submit written comment on these amendments prior to their consideration by council on February 25th, please email or call the committee or council coordinator. Note to committee member, Councillors, a reminder, if you have any, any motion on any of the items listed today, please send a copy to us ahead of the public delegation so that committee members and staff have an opportunity to review and, as necessary, clarify your motion during the discussion of the matter. Thank you. So uh, before we go to uh, our consent agenda, uh, Mr. Desjardins, maybe we'll, uh, we'll have roll call. And I'd like to welcome Councillor uh, Leaper to our meeting today as well. Go okay, ahead. Uh, Councillor Kitts. Here, sorry, I okay. couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> Councillor DeRuz. Here. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Meehan. Here. Councillor Harder. Here. Vice Chair Gower. Here. And Chair El Shantiri. Present. Thank you. You're Thank you, Mr. Desenda. Uh, declaration of interest. See none. We we'll go through cons our consent agenda and uh, we'll come back to. Uh, so, confirmation of minute, minute 19 of uh, December 3rd, 2020, the Agricultural and Rural Affairs Committee uh, meeting on the, me uh, the minutes uh, confirmed. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a presentation, uh, uh, Rural Ontario Municipal Association Municipality uh, Connectivity Roadmap. And uh, for that reason, we invited uh, Councillor Leeper as the chair of the uh, IT subcommittee, but uh, we'll come back to the presentation momentarily. Uh, item number two, from Planning Infrastructure and Economic Development Planning Service, Item number two is the high social impact projects program that the agriculture and rural affairs committees recommend council receive this report for information. Can we receive this report? Received. Received. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, item number three will hold item number three as that's 4497 O'Keefe Court. We have uh, uh, three presentation, one from our staff, one from uh, Ms. Susan Brown and Smith and uh, uh, from Orchard State the Community Association and also from Andrew Glass, the properties group applicant. So we'll hold item three. Item, uh, item number four is the Public Works and Environmental Service Department, Parks, Forestry and Storm, uh, Storm uh, Water Service. And item four is Faulkner Municipal Drain Amendment uh, the, the engineer's report we have, but we do have uh, uh, two delegations to speak on this report, so we'll hold item number four. So we'll go to uh, item uh, number one, and it's a presentation from, uh, from Roma. I'm going to ask uh, our clerk to, uh, to share the screen and put the presentation on the screen, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I try to be brief about this, but this is a very important to all of us. I think lately we're all receiving daily email about the e-learning and e-health and 
the lack of uh, strong broadband in the rural area. Next, and, and Roma, just for our colleague, Roma is, uh, uh, is the Rural Ontario Municipality Association. We, uh, we work together with AMO. AMO represents 444 municipality in Ontario, and Roma is a function to deal with all rural, uh, rural uh, issue in Ontario. And obviously we all know Ottawa, 80% of Ottawa is in the rural for that reason. We're always been participant in Roma uh, uh, almost every year. And I wanna thank Councillor De Roos, usually attend uh, Roma uh, alongside myself. Next slide, please. So a little bit about this, as I mentioned, uh, Roma and the, you know working together with AMO. AMO is a non partisan not for profit association advocate uh, on behalf of Ontario municipality with Ontario government. Next slide, please. So here's here's what Roma has done. Roma been been very strong voice. Uh, for, for, for quite some time now, speaking of broadband, and two years ago, uh, when Premier Ford attended Roma, he declared uh, broadband for the rural area is an essential service, just like having water, electricity on road, we should have good broadband service. And we've been working together with both level of government. And uh, as we, you know, last year, uh, the federal government announced funding for connectivity and what they call it the last mile. And I'm not here as a technical person, but I just want you to know we work together with our local MP in, in, in our community. Also Roma uh, work with, uh, with the government and this file alive even during pandemic, that was uh, the topic we'll talk about the most, uh, even this year's more than other years uh, about the, the you know the lack of broadband service to to the rural area, and and when you know, and sometimes we hear also from our colleague, not necessarily in a rural area, uh, we heard about them. Councillor Harder more than once said, "I can't have my video on uh, in the morning if I'm if I'm at home in Bar Haven." So, and Bar Haven is not a, you know, obviously is a is a high density area. So broadband issue is, is right across, uh, I would say, across the city. If it's you know, and across a lot of small municipality, and 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 uh, there's a chart. I don't want to read it for you, but you can all see the health, the education, the leisure, entertainment, all this, uh, the connectivities we, we need. Next slide, please. I know I'm going through those slides quickly, but I just want to make sure to have time for. Uh, my colleague uh, Jeff Leeper also to to have a comment about this, and uh, we'll have staff uh, to, to continue uh, to continue that discussion. So continue to advocate to the federal government to expedite rollout of broadband. And I think lately some of my colleagues, especially the rural councillor, they've been seeing uh, with the mayor some letter of support for some of the small companies operate in the rural area, uh, support them uh, to uh, enter that, what you call uh, emergency funding for broadband. We met with uh, Minister Monsef and she told us there's one, uh, one and a three quarter billion dollar the federal government, uh, you know, have a set aside for the next year with a mandate to, uh, to help modernize the, you know, the, uh, uh, broadband and, and improve broadband service to uh, to the uh, rural Canada specifically, but Ontario and uh, the federal working together on and share funding. And the reason I brought this item because I know Roma uh, Roma did a, a, a great roadmap uh, for broadband in a rural area, and I didn't want to bring the whole presentation here because it will take quite a bit of time. But uh, maybe. Uh, our staff, clerk staff can email it to you after if you already don't have it, or you can visit uh, Roma uh, and, and you can download it, it's, it's there. It's called uh, Roma Roadmap for Broadband in, in the Rural Area. Uh, next one, please. So here what the, the recommended the actions uh, on the telecom, build better relationships relationship with municipal government, share information, more consistent. And so I don't want to read it, but this is what we are looking for. Uh, if it's too cost prohibitive to build in area of need, do not, you know, 
there's other technology today we are hearing about the develop a sustained uh, relationship with the municipal government and 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 i think this is our role where we we need in the city uh, uh, a point of contact so in the past and that's why i invited chris cope to this meeting in the last 20 years when we saw with the city of ottawa uh, chris cope was uh, expert matter in, in uh, broadband. We worked together with him at the time and uh, to bring uh, uh, broadband to the rural area. And I, I believe the city invested almost $750,000 at the time, uh, helping to erect those towers and helping to bring uh, some uh, cell service to the emergency services in the rural area to be all on the same uh, same uh, technology, uh, their colleagues in the, in the urban or suburban. So we work together with uh, with Chris Cope and and you know even now any question about the information, uh, the layout of uh, we, we heard lately is uh, quite a bit of companies, small companies looking to invest in a rural area and bring uh, fiber optic. And uh, what's our role here as a municipality? Uh, obviously, they're requesting uh, some of it, the use of uh, the utility, Hydro One or Hydro Ottawa utility pole, use the right of way for, from the city of Ottawa and what else the city can help to provide. And that's why we're looking uh, for economic development to, to be uh, helping us. Uh, to, to respond to some of those requests coming uh, from other. Uh, next slide, please. And he's determined what role municipality can play. Obviously, I spoke a little bit too soon about this, but uh, this is uh, clearly, let's, uh, mar you know, uh, the advocacy side, uh, the municipal uh, own broadband network, and, uh, uh, and, and how could we help? So we get so many requests from uh, company uh, looking for a letter of support from the mayor and the rural councillors. Uh, how how could we maximize uh, that uh, role of us, and how can we we help them? Uh, you know, obviously the municipality don't have uh, the money. Uh, the federal government and the, and the provincial government are put together toward improvement for broadband, uh, broadband services in the rural municipalities. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we have a role to play. And I like that uh, role to be uh, uh, to be clear so to all of us. Uh, when I spoke with Councillor Kitts, she was telling me she had the same issue in the east uh, part of the city uh, in a rural area when it comes to broadband. And I have the same problem in Kimber in the west end of the city. Uh, next slide, please. So here is the, uh, again, how, uh, you know, the implementation and how, uh, so we have a, you know, I have someone from uh, 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 Carlton University reach out at the university, like to uh, work with the municipality. There's, uh, uh, there's a possibility uh, of a partnership and how could we, uh, uh, we do some municipal access agreement, uh, uh, and, and obviously, there's uh, there's so many so many balls in the air. But in the end of the day, uh, residents come to us, and they think as a municipal councillors we have all the answers. And and you know, and even when we say this is not a municipal uh, really issue, we like to help. We like to work with other level of government. They still expect us to follow up. They expect us to lead. Uh, and and. Um, obviously, I understand the challenge they have, especially family with the kids at home uh, in Kinburn or in, in, in Starfield or anywhere part of the rural part of the city that have a challenge today with the e-learning and have their kids working from home or learning from home. Uh, next step. Next slide, please. And here's uh, the Universal Broadband Fund. There's so much fun we hear about uh, and uh, they this is where Roma landed with the federal government uh, when we met with, uh, with Minister Monsef, the, the, the government of Canada committed the 1.75 billion over six years. 
750 million available for large impact project and 50 million available to support mobile project that primary benefit indigenous uh, peoples or community and up to 150 million available as as a part of a rapid response stream. And that's the one getting some attention lately because uh, all the applicant has to be submitted uh, by February 15. This is in addition to the 600 million agreement with the TELSAT uh, to secure uh, advanced low earth uh, orbit LEO capacity. Next. And uh, the, uh, again, the other, as I said, uh, uh, the applications, the rapid response was due, I think, not January 50, I believe. Oh, sorry, yes. The rest of the program due February 15 with the project to be completed by March 31st, 2027. Next. I think that's, uh, it. that's it, Jeff. That's, that's my last uh, slide. Thank you very much, uh, Kat, for running the. And, uh, I see uh, Councillor Harder put her hand up, but before we go to Councillor Harder, I was wondering if uh, uh, Chris Cope, did I miss anything? Because uh, obviously we've been working with you very closely with Roma uh, and all the information. Did I miss anything uh, from my presentation? Uh, I think your presentation is very complete uh, with the possible exception of uh, just naming the provincial support um, through their program that they call ICON, where they too okay. are, have offered some money and both the provincial and the federal program allow stacking. So uh, um, a, a telco could actually apply for both and take money from both to complete a build. Okay. Uh, Councillor Leeper, would you like to add something I miss or something you think we, we need to as a municipal or as, as a municipal government, we need to do. Uh, as far as support to those companies coming to us uh, uh, who operate in a rural area, we are providing, we are providing a, a letter. Of, so go ahead, Councillor Leeper. Yep, I just want to see if okay. Lily maybe mutes her uh, her mic. Um, no, and thank you very much for the presentation. The uh, the rural broadband connectivity issue is a, is a really frustrating one. I actually just did a uh, quick speed test uh, sitting here in Hintonburg, and with three adults in the house, most of us are on Zoom at the same time. I'm getting 280 megs per second download and 21 up. Um, you know, the uh, the disparity between what is available in the rural areas and in the urban areas is, is often very striking. The city has actually begun to do some of that work with rights of way folks to ensure that um, when providers want to bring things like fiber out to uh, the rural areas, that uh, we're trying to facilitate that. Uh, in the governance review, something that uh, Councillor Moffat and I worked on in last term of council, where small providers were having a difficult time getting municipal access agreements to hang their equipment on our poles. We've, we've now delegated that to staff to try to, um, uh, to avoid the council vote and, and to try to ensure that that's moving more quickly. Uh, we do have a smart city strategy and that smart city strategy uh, recognizes that broadband connectivity for the whole city can be a spectrum of responses. Um, everything from simply making sure that at the uh, the staff level that we're providing some some concierge service to providers who want to serve all the way up to providing municipal broadband uh, as as an ISP. I don't think that this council is interested in becoming an ISP, but there are a lot of steps shy of that that we can do in terms of um, using some of the assets the city has. You mentioned them in your presentation. We have poles, we have conduits, we have a utility company in, in Hydro Ottawa that has expertise, uh, trying to ensure that we are leveraging those assets as best we can to ensure rollout. Um, I know our IT staff um, have been extraordinarily busy for the last year, uh, just trying to ensure that you know our corporation is able to work from home and they're, they're scrambling to keep our partners uh, afloat in terms of IT connectivity. But I think you can expect to see that you know as we continue to roll out smart city thinking that the role of the city in providing broadband is going to continue to be a priority um, because you know not only are um, 
uh, we have issues around the affordability of broadband internet, as well as simply making broadband internet available to many people in the rural areas at all. So I'll, I'll just stay, uh, leave it there, and I'm, I'm curious to hear from, uh, from the rest of committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Leeper. Councillor Harder, and then Councillor Moffitt. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Al Shantiri, um, you know, it's been, um, I think, kind of a lost opportunity for about four years that we've been at the farm. Well, it's three and a half years now um, at the farm across from the Sportsplex uh, area X.0. I mean, in a city that has the best of the companies in Canada if, and, and second, uh, you know, second only in IT to, uh, to um, Silicon Valley in the States. Um, and with the opportunity there surrounded by dark fiber <clears throat> that um, uh, Hydro Ottawa has uh, laid and, uh, um, and all the technology that's in there, 5G. I mean, I don't know why we haven't been chosen other than the fact we're the nation's capital and we tend to be um, punished for that sometimes. You know, why would we want to keep, uh, you know, a large amount of money here for a solution? I think we have the capacity right here to do that. And I think that, um, you know, as uh, every level of government comes out with more money to um, service uh, rural broadband in Canada, um, we should have a piece of that because we have an, an incredible setup uh, that we can use in the heart of our city in the geographic center of Ottawa. Uh, it's quite amazing. So um, keep plugging away. Uh, somebody will make a breakthrough someday. Invest Ottawa, uh, um, well, Chris will tell you, uh, works um, extremely well and has a lot of expertise in this area as well as the staff that uh, work with them. So uh, I think the more people we have, uh, looking for those opportunities and that funding, uh, the, the sooner it will happen. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councillor Harder. Councillor Murphy. Thanks, I was almost aghast when Jeff said that he gets 280 up. There was a day in the fall where I was one up, one down. That was the service level I was getting. Um, so I, I have, I live in a more remote uh, area, so um, been working with different providers, and I know Explornet's been, I've actually upgraded within Explornet to better service now, because uh, they're expanding their their service offering in the area, Storm as well. I spoke with Bell, um, intend, to, intend to reach out and speak with Rogers and tell us too, just focusing on that, you know, we have a lot of customers, and we all do in the rural area that we, that constantly reach out to us about these issues. So, you know, any work that Roma can do, I know AMO does a lot of work on this front as well, but anything that, um, that can be done, Explornet's currently looking at uh, the, the, uh, the grant program uh, to provide better service uh, throughout rural Ottawa. Um, you know, I, I personally, whoever the service provider is, I'm not really too concerned. Uh, what I care about is that we, we do what we can to get the best service possible for our constituents across this city. Uh, we often do get left out. I know there's the Eastern Ontario uh, resource network that, that is doing a, a one gig project. Uh, Ottawa's left out of that. So it's, you know, they're kind of doing their thing together. And then we have to sort of focus on our own because we're, we're part of that bigger city. So it's a bit of a gap. It can be sometimes, and uh, we need to work with our, our private partners, the ISPs to be able to hopefully uh, capitalize on some of these, these investment opportunities from the provincial federal governments. Thanks, Eli. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moffitt. Councillor Kidd. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know that when we were chatting uh, prior to this meeting and when we had a conversation, we had some interesting ideas about um, an opportunity to partner with the city, lend us some of their resources, um, potentially some of their grant money to sort of explore this. But they were really looking for a point person. Um, a, city staff member that could be the point person and I know we were both hoping um that that could be identified so is that Mr. Cope or is that still yet um to be determined well in uh, and I I'm not sure if Mr. Willis on the call I did speak with Mr. Willis and is there's a direction here I am preparing I would uh, 
I will introduce it after uh, we hear from all my colleagues. Uh, you're right. What, what we are missing all along, we got an email from a resident, you know, asking so many questions. We're not technical people. The best thing to do, we always do, send it to Chris Cope. Chris Cope, you know, work with our staff. We, we, we you know, we, so that's what we look, and there's so many, so many uh, opportunity out there, whether from the federal government or the provincial government or the private uh, service. Councillor Moffat talked about them. Like me. We met with all of them and we invite them to our uh, ward and we show them and we work with But I mean, at the end of the day, you need someone to be a quarterback. And that's what I'm looking for. And I know when we talk about staff and in the city during the pandemic, everybody looked the other way, you know, they're scared. Of, but we do have, within our own organization, uh, people be available to do this work for us. And I'm hoping after I, I do my direction and staff come back to us uh, in the second quarter, we, we have a clear direction or position where we are in. But right now, as we speak, in the rural broadband is do with economic development. Uh, innovation technology is with uh, Valerie, Turners, uh, but, I mean, we need them working together, and I think the two group need to work. But as far as I'm concerned, my advice to you: anytime you have a question of this nature, I will send it to Mr. Cole, or send it to me, and I'll I'll try to to help get to the the answer we need. Because your issue in in the East End, same thing, can burn or South the city or anywhere in the city. But I I will read my okay. uh, directions to staff after. Thank you. Councillor Daru. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I know that uh, we've been talking about very important subject for broadband and in general in rural areas specifically. And I want to touch on Councillor Moffat's comment because I totally, I'm not going to repeat what he said because we all face it every day, day in and day out. Like we're all in it, we're all in the same, uh, uh, we all have same issues, same challenges, but uh, also Councillor Shantiri, uh, uh, he's been working through Roma in the last five years to making sure also uh, that to consider Aroa when they put their planning and when they put their rural grant to making sure Aroa got some of it. And the issue in the previous when we had uh, uh, the grant uh, for natural gas or any other things, city of Ottawa were considered major cities, so we would not be able to get any of these grants. So I want to thank Councillor Shantiri and the effort that uh, his effort in Roma and AMO to uh, bring this attention to our ministers at the provincial level to kind of take a look at it. Because really, uh, like Councillor Moffat mentioned, if uh, Eastern Ontario had a specific program, uh, we are excluded from it. So there's been lots of work happening behind the scene and the city of Ottawa, like we all know, we have major geographically challenging an issue. So like the east, south, north, we're all, uh, we're all having the same challenges. So I just want to take that moment to thank you, Councillor Shantiri, and thank you, Councillor Moffat, because we understand the issue because we know what's going on. And I'm hoping uh, throughout the challenges and who, in the future when there is grant come out, we'll keep advocating for the resident in rural Ottawa to making sure to get some money out of that one. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor DeRuth. Councillor Uh Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't want to state the obvious, but uh, this has been an issue for such a long time and it's taken on uh, quite the urgency right now. And I'm just wondering if uh, when in any of our communication, if we can, if there's a way to highlight uh, that this isn't, this is no longer an option and it can't wait that this is affecting children's uh, schooling, it's affecting their future, um, that someone's just got, the burners have to be put on now. And uh, if um, there's a way to, um, to highlight that, that this, is, this can't be an option, that we can't wait anymore, that this, is, this has to be done and done fast. So um, I'm sure that uh, people who know a lot more than me can figure out how that should be, but I think uh, it, is a, it is an emergency right now. And not just in the rural areas, we're, we're all through the city, we're, we're facing this, you know? Uh, Jeff was saying what he's facing, it, in, the, in my home it's the same thing, you know? And uh, so it is prohibitive. We, I'm always asking the kids, can you stay off the computer this morning? Can you, you know, this kind of thing so that we can, we can uh, get into meetings. So yeah, this is an emergency and uh, we've got to do something now. So that's all I have to say, thanks. 
Thank you, thank you, Councilor Mehans. And and uh, again, what, what Councilor Kitts and I were talking about is, it's ha so many effort out there. We hear so many uh, application out there. So much uh, money from the federal, from the province, from other. And how how could we help uh, to? I know the city doesn't have money, and I'm not asking the city to to to, to for money, but we're asking the city to help those. Uh, groups who's coming to us for for assistance, whether with the right of way, utility, anything, and and I think Councillor uh, Deeper, uh, I think three four years ago was trying to make sure the small company also have uh, have a role to play, not just the major uh, uh, major uh, provider. So there's a direction here, and uh, we, we might have to feel free to modify it, but I'm going to read it. <coughs> Direct the staff to bring an information report to ARAP no later than the end of Q2 2021 to describe the current policy and financial environment on rural broadband, the role of the senior government, the role of the city, and area that economic development with support from right of way can advocate for improved services in the rural Ottawa. So, and Honestly, I put it in rural Ottawa, and I think it would be fair to say in Ottawa without just the rural, because we all have uh, have this issue. And <clears throat> I will take the word, uh, and I will give it to the to Mr. Desjardins. So I'm going to have it with service in Ottawa without the rural. And Councillor Derouze is right. There's also we need help from <clears throat> from our senior management to to always include Ottawa when we talk about rural broadband, rural natural gas, any application, because it seems if we're not on the table, they think the city, oh, they, you know, is the capital of Canada, so they're not rural. And we, every time we have to make our case, no, 80% of Ottawa is rural, and we, we have the same issue uh, any other uh, rural municipality has. So uh, if no other speaker, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, receive this presentation. Can we receive it and with the direction to staff and to come back to us in the Q2 of 2021 uh, for improved service in Ottawa. The same, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yep. Thank, you. thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Councillor Leeper, for joining us today. Feel free to stay if you like. We're a friendly uh, group. Thank you. Uh, now we go to, uh, to item number three. Item number three, four, four, nine, seven, O'Keefe Court. And I'm going to ask, uh, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Moore is going to do the presentation. I'm not sure if uh, Mr. James is going to do introduction to the report. Uh, I'll leave it to you folks. Oh, here's Doug. Okay. Good morning, Mr. James. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, well, if um, what we have, uh, mem Chair and members of uh, committee, uh, is a quick presentation. We have um, Lily here today to answer questions along with Sean Moore, who is the file lead. So I'll turn it over to Sean, who will give us a, as I said, a quick presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. James. Sean? Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. My name's Sean Moore. I'm the file lead for this zoning report. You can go to the next slide. So the subject site is a approximately seven hectare parcel. It abuts Highway 416 to the immediate west and uh, the city park, which is Lytle Park to the east. The Cedar Hill uh, Golf and Country Club and Orchard Estate subdivision is located approximately 350 meters from the property to the east and northeast. Uh, and there's also an expansion of a, there's also a, a state lot residential subdivision to the north and a, and a draft plan expansion for it. Um, and the lands immediately budding this subject property would be conservation lands because there's some wetlands immediately north of 4497. And there's also a proposal for to connect that future expansion of the um, state lot with a public road uh, that would go down between the subject lands and Lytle Park connecting to O'Keefe Court. So their uh, proposal for a future uh, city street uh, to the immediately uh, west of Lytle Park. Um, the lands uh, surrounding are all on private services and south of O'Keefe Court, Court is a uh, business park that's uh, developing and that's in the urban area. You can go to the next slide please. So in the official plan the subject property is uh, in the general rural area. 
and it represents O'Keeffe Court represents the divide of the urban and rural area. Should be noted in 2008, there was an application to uh, this committee to bring municipal water to 4497 O'Keeffe, which was approved and it remains on private septic. Next slide, please. So just, this just gives context of the, um, the urban area to the south and the secondary plan, which is in place for the business park on the south side of O'Keeffe. Uh, that's in the uh, area nine and 10 secondary plan. That's a business park that um, has zoning, which doesn't permit warehousing. Next slide, please. So the subject uh, proposal. So existing today, the permitted uses on the subject property are warehousing, light industrial, office, research and development, tech industry. Uh, the proposal is to amend the exception zone because it's it has an exception 401R, which basically there's a statement in there that says any single warehouse use may occupy up to a maximum 50% of the gross floor area of any building. So the applicant is proposing to remove that provision and uh, maintain all the other provisions. So all the other land uses. And there's also a holding symbol on the property, which requires site plan control uh, to be approved before the H can be lifted. So if we just dive into the that provision, uh, I could give you an example uh, of what that would mean is so for example, today roughly given parking requirements, uh, septic field requirements, uh, the lot coverage they're permitted in their zoning, they could conceivably or the applicant could build a 250 square foot building. Uh, so and half of that could be warehousing. The other half would have to be occupied by another uh, tenant, such as a light industrial use. So that's a 125,000 square foot warehouse. Or they could propose multiple buildings, such as 200,000 square foot buildings with 50% occupancy of being a warehouse. So that's currently what uh, the applicant could, could do. Next slide, please. So staff are recommending approval to remove 50% um, as the, the lands are are immediately uh, located to the with, within about a, a thousand meters of Grand Fowl Village, um, we end the zoning to um, to attract a tenant, a single use tenant of even ten thousand square square meters um, or square feet. The applicant would have to do some sort of amendment to that fifty percent. Uh, we also uh, support it uh, just. The matter of fact that also the H exists on the property, so no matter what, the applicant is going to have to go through a site plan control process and uh, deal with the, the lift the holding provision once they seek site plan approval. Once we know more about the tenant and the nature of the buildings and who would occupy them, then staff would require a, a further transportation study to to figure out uh, exactly the users of the building and how that has impact on uh, on signals down the street or accesses and so forth. And finally, this is a, a site plan. There was an active site plan in 2016 uh, that remains on hold while the applicant, uh, I guess, determines what kind of tenants they can they can bring to this, uh, the property and how they're gonna reconfigure the buildings and so forth. But this is one of their concepts that they have developed. Overall, the applicant's concept is for a multi-building um, multi site uh, with multiple tenants and looking for flexibility to attract different tenants into the, the, the various buildings. And uh, I'll leave it at that and just uh, want to thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much, Sean. And since we have two other presentations, we'll hear them all and then we can take questions to staff or to, uh, uh, to Ms. Uh, Brown and Smith or to Andrew Glass, the, the proponent. So we'll go to uh, Susan. Susan, are you available for your presentation? Oh, I see you on the, you're on mute, Susan. Hello, Eli. Hello. Here, counselor, it's a pleasure to see you all. So this is not your first rodeo. You know, Susan, you have five minutes and you, I know you have a presentation for us. I do. Is uh, Mark going to pull that up for everyone? I believe the clerk is working on it. It's coming up very shortly. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Because we don't want to stop the clock when I only have five minutes. 
That's um, right. Okay, so I'm gonna run through this very quickly. I would like to thank you all very much for the opportunity to provide this presentation to the committee uh, with regards to the public application. Slide two, please. Um, I don't wanna duplicate uh, what Sean provided, but one of the things that's really key here is, is that the O'Keefe Court is a, is a boundary of a large rural zone that spans the 416 to Hunt Club, to Woodruff, back up Battlefield, and back down O'Keefe. And we really treasure this rural area as the city grows up around us. And it's been especially um, special during the COVID-19 lockdowns. The Prestige Business Park, which is shown there on the slide in green, serves as a rural to urban transition zone. It's special. Um, all of the stakeholders have worked together to create something that is going to work for everybody. The Prestige Business Park, um, any development that's downstream has to be, um, must not undermine that rural to urban transition zone. And O'Keefe benefits as a protected local road. 4497 is not an island unto itself and any development there must be complimentary. Next slide, please. 4497, we implore the committee to appreciate the fundamental change the zoning amendment has on the property and the surrounding lands. It will permit a single tenant large scale warehouse or distribution center complex. The size and number of the buildings does not change this outcome. This use has already been rejected as non-compliant and does not fit with the prestige business park uh, rural to urban transition zone. So what's changed? The 50% restriction was put in place as a compromise to support the original park business park concept of multi-tenant, multi-uses that complement the prestige business park. And this compromise must be respected. There is no net benefit to our adjacent lands or our community from this zoning amendment. And in fact, it achieves the opposite outcome. Next slide, traffic. It's not the only concern that we have, but boy, is it a biggie. Everyone agrees that the current traffic studies are out of date and a poor foundation for an informed decision. This table shows the original traffic that was anticipated with the property is four small to medium trucks running in the day. And that is vastly different from 15 to 16, 40 foot, 80 ton trucks running at night, potentially every two to three minutes. And that is what this zoning amendment will permit. So why would we remove a restriction that incentivizes this outcome based on data that we know is wrong? Next slide, provincial policy statement. The point of this, this slide is, is that a single tenant large distribution center would require costly infrastructure changes, rural incompatibility issues and development patterns not compliant with the provincial policy statement and it is not guidelines and they must be respected. Next slide, employment area of vision. Employment area of vision is a valuable and important planning tool. It informs planning decisions for the subject property. Conducting <clears throat> this vision is paramount to minimizing impact on surrounding lands. Warehousing is only one of many options that the developer has to make a positive contribution to the area and it is a jewel. So why are we incentivizing a use that is less than optimum and encourages the very type of truck traffic we seek to avoid? Last slide recommendation. Committee, you have the power to decide how development proceeds. We implore you to make an informed and balanced decision with net positive benefits to all stakeholders, not just one. And you are not informed. The traffic date is out of date. The potential long-term impacts are horrific. Traffic, health, environment, and more. And now is the time for ARAC to show leadership. If the applicant chooses to bring forward an application that provides us all with sufficient details so that all stakeholders can make informed decisions with awareness of the impacts, we would welcome that. Working together, we can accomplish amazing developments, but throwing away a compromise that was put in place for a very good reason to begin with is not the way that the good development should proceed. And for that reason, the Orchard States Community Association recommends that you deny the application. Thank you, and I, and I hope I have achieved getting in in my five minute wire. <laughs> You did. You did, Susan. Thank you very much uh, you, for yeah. your presentation. And uh, we'll go to uh, the final presentation. Um, okay, yes. Go okay. ahead. Just, uh, 
So uh, Andrew Glass is the properties group applicant. We ha also have a power presentation. Mr. Glass, are you? Uh... Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can. Oh, very good, thank you. Um, again, my name is Andrew Glass. I, I'm uh, Director of uh, Development Acquisitions here at the Properties Group, and um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, respond to uh, this application. You know, this has obviously gathered a lot of attention over the last few days. Um, seems to be a, some great concern about um, the size of, of what we have here or what we're proposing. So I think the site plan is up on the on the screen that you have in front of you. Uh, what, what I what, just preface things that it is not our intention to develop the site as an Amazon type Wayfair scale type distribution warehouse. That has never been our intention. Uh, we see the market opportunity, you know, we see the market opportunity here for smaller light industrial and warehouse type uses, but nothing of the scale uh, that we see at, at Amazon. Uh, the likes of which could include, you know, plumbing parts suppliers, electrical parts suppliers that have a warehouse component together with an accessory showroom, but not on that scale. The conceptual plan that you see in front of you there is, is, a, is a campus style development comprised of you know, several buildings totaling, as Sean pointed out, somewhere between 200 and 250,000 square feet. Um, the concept plan is, you know, it's nowhere near the scale of, of what has happened uh, or is happening with the Amazon. And I don't mean to pick on Amazon, but um, you know, if you look at that, the 69,000 square foot building for comparison purposes only, that's slightly smaller, about 10,000 square feet smaller than the Loblaw store at the Barhaven Town Center. And the other buildings, such as the, the 19,000 square foot building, again, these are concept, you know, that has, the plan has no status, it's still subject to site plan approval. That building would be about the size of what you've been to, the farm boy at Woodbridge and Claridge. Again, these, and the other, three, the other three or four that are shown here in the 35, 40,000 square foot range, that's your metro store. That's, that's the, the scale. So. I'm just trying to distance ourselves from the Amazon type size. So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to get across um, here. Um, the proposed campus is comprised of several buildings. So uh, it's understood now that there's a, there's a motion uh, that is being considered to remove this, this 50% cap on, on a warehousing, uh, on warehousing within a building. And, and just to point out the difference there, if you look at that 19,000 square foot building, with that 50% cap that's there, if, if we had a tenant that came to us and said, like a, I'll use like a Westburn Ready Electric, a plumbing, like an electrical parts supplier came to us and said, yeah, we're, we're, we need about 19,000 feet. And we have to turn around and say, well, we can give you eight and they go somewhere else. Well, that's the type of tenant that this zoning that is in place contemplated. And, and now with that cap, it, it frustrates or it prevents us from from tenanting the building with that type of a tenant. So removing that cap. Now, to get to the idea of, get to some sort of compromise here in the spirit of cooperation that we understand there's a, a motion on the table where we have agreed to a hard cap on the size of any individual warehouse type tenant. And we, we I think the hard cap that we've sort of come to is about 88,000 square feet, I use square feet, about 8,175 square meters. That, Gives, should give the community association enough comfort that this is not going to be on the same scale, anywhere close to being the same scale as a, as a Wayfair or, a, or, a, or a Amazon type warehouse. And, and we're in the spirit of cooperation, we're satisfied to live with that, that compromise. And we, we would hope that the community association would, would find their way to find that satisfactory as well. Many of the other issues that were brought up by um, Ms. Brown were are you know things like traffic that would be dealt with at site plan approval stage. You know provincial policy statement issues. You know the infrastructure improvements that were revolve around building that, in, that interchange there. That supports this type of use. That's what the provincial policy statement tries to encourage. Is that one minute use the existing infrastructure that's there to support the land uses that are being proposed, as opposed to building new infrastructure somewhere else. With that, um, I'll leave it. Um, I'll turn it back over to the chair and thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Glass, for your presentation. Also, uh, also uh, from, we received five emails. All against the report have been received and circulated to committee members. Uh, 
Now we receive all three presentations. We're gonna ask committee member if they have any question and uh, who they need to direct their question to. So we have the staff, we have the community or uh, Orchard Community Association and we have Andrew the, on behalf of the, the proponent group. So uh, uh, any question from committee members? Uh, Councillor Moffat, I see you had them. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I find that this, um, this application is somewhat similar almost to a situation that uh, we dealt with at this committee um, about a year and a half ago almost uh, in terms of an application of, of existing land uh, zoned for these types of purposes, uh, general rural lands in the village of, of Northcourt. Um, what I find is that the opportunity to come to committee with an application like this gives us a chance to address some of those concerns from a, a larger perspective scale. So the concern here appears to be mainly that, um, well, I'm not going to say I don't want to minimize or anything, but but one of the main concerns is that it could become one large scale operation site on this on this property. I think the the motion before the motion, the proposed motion, the proposed amendment uh, to cap the building size, I think really helps address that. I'm just interested in hearing from Ms. Brandrick Smith their thoughts on that on that compromise where we would put a cap on the building footprint uh, so that no building larger than I believe it's 78,000 square feet uh, could be built on this site. Ms. Brownring? Yes, okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay, we can. Good. Thank you, Scott, so much for that, that question. I, I, I do appreciate it. Um, and I would like to thank Andrew Goss for his presentation as well, and, and Sean Moore. Um, in response to your question, um, I think there's two points that we need to bring forward. Um, the motion, and I have had an opportunity to review it, actually doesn't solve the problem because the site is allowed to be 100% warehousing. That's, that's our current conundrum. So the size of the building is, it, it's a red herring. And the intentions of the developer are a red herring. The, the fact of the matter is this zoning amendment as currently written would allow 100% large scale um, distribution or warehousing complex and the building size restriction does not achieve um, the net benefit outcome that we're looking for, which is to ensure that the development proceeds uh, in a manner where the type of traffic um, is scaled back to that with the original con concept for the site. Um, and yes, there are certain items that can be looked at later when, in terms of when we get to site plan and how the provincial policy statement will apply, et cetera. Um, but fundamentally, what we're not seeing here is any net benefit to any stakeholder other than the applicant. And, is in, and it actually incentivizes the very type of development that we all agree is not optimum. All right, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's tough, right? Because I, uh, transportation issues, traffic issues are are generally associated with the site plan process and not necessarily with the zoning process. And, and I tried to work with this on uh, with staff to understand exactly what's being asked for here and understanding that a building of, let's say 100,000 square feet could be built on this site that would actually be 50% warehouse on one side and 50% warehouse on the other side. Um, so it's, you know, the fact that that exists, that it could be a 100,000 square foot warehouse just separated in two with two different tenants um, seems to, seems to be at odds with the, with the notion that it's an issue uh, to remove the 50% cap because it seems like the warehouse use is there no matter what. Um, now we're just seeing that they want to proceed with maybe just 100% of a building to be one tenant. And I don't, I don't know if I see that as being um, such a negative considering the existing zoning does permit 100% uh, of a building to be a warehouse as is merely that there would just be two occupants. So thanks for, thanks for the presentation. I just That's kind of where I'm at with this right now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thank you, Councillor Moffitt. Mr. And you, Chair. I, yeah, I'd like you. To, yes, I was going to say, Councillor yeah. Hart, maybe you should introduce your motion, please. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask you if you wanted me to, and then, okay. um, and 
Uh, Ms. Brownrigg-Smith um, um, is aware of this motion because we had quite a long chat last night. And although probably none of you know Susan Brownrigg-Smith, I can say that in my entire elected life of almost 24 years, not one single person knows as much about planning in Barhaven as Susan Brown McSmith. Um, and I say that having represented all of Barhaven uh, as it grew until 2006. And then that would include people in Heart's Desire who definitely know a lot as well. But, but Susan, um, I would say is uh, one of the architects of areas um, nine and 10, uh, going back to the nineties. Uh, so she knows of that which she speaks. Um, so what uh, this motion does, and, and, and it surprises me, it doesn't give Susan and her community what they want, which is sustain the uh, previously um, agreed to position. But I am surprised, quite frankly, that at the willingness um, of the applicant uh, to um, put this uh, in writing and to agree to it. Um, and so the important part, I think, is the fact that it, it, it speaks to no single warehouse building and or use can be greater than 8,175.5 square meters of gross floor area in size. And, um, and also, um, Ms. Brownrigg Smith had asked to defer the item until the next ARAC meeting. But instead of that, uh, this was supposed to go to rise to council next Wednesday. And um, I'm asking you to support uh, delaying that, deferring it until February 24th council meeting. Um, because I know that uh, uh, Susan wants to, to work on it further. And um, I support that. So as I said, this is, uh, well, actually, you know, as Councillor Moffat said, uh, right now their right to have a warehouse exists. Their right to have a much larger warehouse than what this motion will do exists. Uh, I think up to 125,000 square uh, feet. And this will restrict it to about 88,000 square feet. I think that the, personally, and Susan knows this, so does Lily, because Lily was the, um, uh, was the planner uh, on the file uh, every time we've talked about this. Um, I've never liked this. I've never, I've also always thought of it that it was a waste of this land uh, at this location. Um, I am, you know, the difficulty has always been though, the fact that it is rural. So on one side of O'Keefe, you have Prestige Business Park because Prestige Business Park is on city services completely. Whereas this one has been allowed to connect to, uh, to um, uh, our, our water system, uh, but still will have a septic bed, uh, which will take up part of the property as well. And unless that changes, and as you know, um, at our joint committee that uh, all the members of ARAC were part of and planning committee, um, this area uh, was, uh, we had uh, two presentations to include it and to, uh, um, to change it from rural to uh, urban. And um, one was from uh, Mr. Noel um, Pereira and the other one was from uh, Madame. And um, so, were that to happen, that would be a game changer for this uh, land as well. So we have what we have to deal with. We have an application before us. Um, Susan's concerns, and Susan, I'm just calling you Susan because, you know, not to be rude, but it's just who we are. Um, but because uh, I think that it, it makes it better, we have the, the compliance of the uh, applicant and they, will be on uh, advised and on, on record of understanding how important this land is to the integrity of this community. It's very important. And they're always gonna be on the watch. Um, and, um, you know, I told you about the history that I have with, uh, with the community, but in particular with uh, Susan. So 
Um, you had the motion on the screen. I don't think that I need to read it out uh, because you all can read yourself. And as I said, Susan has seen this. Somebody's trying to get me on my phone here. I made the mistake of coming to the ward office. That's why <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff happening. I'm the only one here, but it's uh, distracting. So I would ask you to support this. Um, I look forward to uh, further discussion with uh, the applicant and with uh, Susan. And um, when I think back to how we got with the, to the original agreement, it really was about those places like a Westboro kind of a carpet place or the rising kitchen place or, you know, where people would go to a showroom and there'd be a warehouse to, uh, that, that would deliver to a high growth area. Uh, and the location, you know, could, would serve Kempville to Prescott for that matter. Uh, certainly it would be a great location. Anyway, I think that this makes it better and I would ask that you support this, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Chair Harder. And, uh, and we do have, we still have uh, hands up. Uh, uh, I thought uh, Vice Chair has his hand up first, but we'll go to Councillor Meehan. Councillor Meehan. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, I would ask, Steph, are we going to be updating um, some of the information, uh, like the studies on traffic? Will will that be uh, will that be happening before we make an ultimate decision on this on this uh, property? Well, traffic. I mean, staff can answer that, but traffic is going to come part of the site plan approval. Right now, we're talking about the zoning application. But maybe Steph, uh, Sean, or Lily want to answer. I, I, okay, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Mr. Chair, that, that's correct that the um, this, a, a site plan would come forward to implement whatever uh, whatever um, buildings they're looking to construct, and we would require our uh, update to the transportation study at that time because right now there is a 2016 transportation study that's um, higher level showing their vision of their multiple buildings, and that's what we're relying on. But depends on what configuration and what uses come forward with the site plan. Um, Councillor Meehan, Councillor Meehan, you're on mute. You muted. Right. Um, I'm just wondering. My my concern sometimes is because Miss Brownberg Smith was citing the uh, outdated studies uh, being used to for the zoning application. Um, that. I have, sometimes I think we do it backwards, that we should be looking at, at the impacts of any great development on this area right now, what it's gonna to do to traffic in the area. Once it's uh, you know, at site plan, uh, sometimes it, it just goes through because it's gone through that stage. Um, I may be wrong, because I've been wrong, wrong a lot, but I am concerned about uh, that. I don't know if uh, Ms. Smith can, can address that. If it is a legitimate concern for, for her, I don't think it is for me too. Yeah, thank uh, you, Carolyn. Yeah. Sorry, Eli, am I allowed to respond? Yes, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. We said we question all of you at the same time. Okay. Um, Caroline, thank you very much for your question. Um, we do know that the traffic studies, when they are combined for the area, are uh, grossly out of date. Uh, we do know that the build out and the approved developments um, far exceed what um, the current traffic studies are. And you raise a very good point. Um, we have concerns that if a zoning amendment is brought forward, um, yet the road infrastructure is really not there and it's going to exacerbate bottlenecks. And in addition to that, um, the amendment itself would undermine the basic principles of O'Keefe being a rural local road, then passing this amendment or, or even a motion, quite frankly, I don't even think is fair to the, to the developer because it's creating a scenario where there are expectations created that downstream, the site plan may not even be feasible. So as you say, in some respects, we are putting the cart before the horse. And we are concerned that the zoning amendment simply exacerbates that problem at this point. Any other okay. question, Councillor Meehan? Uh, no, but um, thank you. I appreciate the answer. 
Uh, any other question from my colleagues? I see none. So uh, we're going to vote on uh, the motion from Chair Harder or Councillor Harder on, uh, uh, on this item. I believe uh, uh, our legal staff are okay with uh, uh, referring this to February 24th council meeting. So it doesn't go to council on February 10th, we go to council 24. So therefore, be it resolved that staff recommended maintaining the proposal to remove the 50% growth floor area cap but to be amended to introduce a new cap on the size of a single warehouse building, such as new exception, as added to section 240 rural exception 400 R, uh, Holman V stating no single warehouse building and slash or use can be greater than 8,175.5 uh, 8, square meter in size and therefore be it resolved that the rezoning report for 4497 O'Keefe Court be deferred until February 24, 2021 City Council meeting. The further resolve that there is no further notice pursuant to this plan and uh, subsection 34, subsection 17. Mr. Chair, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask, can I just say one thing? I, I noticed an error. It, it should be 401 R in the exception zone. I don't want that overlooked. Is, no, no, it is exception. 400 R. Yes, you're it, right. It should be 401. N1. Okay. Yes, so sorry. We replace, Thank so you. we can replace the R to N1? 401 R should be the okay. correct. Okay. 401. Okay. Thank you. I think the clerk took notes of the changes. Uh, so uh, do we need the A's and A's on the motion or the motion carry? Carried. Carried. Okay. Okay, okay. So the motion carried and uh, on the item, carry as amended. Carry as amended. Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan and uh, Andrew for, uh, for your presentation and to our staff as well. Now we go to uh, item number four, Faulkner Municipal Drain Amendment to the Engineer's Report. Uh, now we do have... Uh, Two folks uh, delegation, uh, Jeff Dawson uh, as a delegate to speak on uh, item number four. Jeff, I see you on the screen, but um, Mark, can you let Mr. Hi. Dawson? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Mr. Oh. Dawson, we can. Go ahead. You have five minutes to address the committee. Uh, I own the property at the very south end of the Faulkner Drain. Um, we've been farming there for 200 years. Uh, we lost the northeast corner of our farm in uh, the 70s when uh, they realigned the Shea Road. And, and now you're going to take more land from the, to widen the ditch. Um, I'm really not satisfied with the amount of compensation that's uh, showing in the chart, on Schedule F. But to me, it works out to about $7,000 an acre. Uh, and properties in the area have been selling for almost 20,000 an acre. There are five properties for sale in the area. And they're asking $30,000 an acre. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Dawson. Do you have any questions for Mr. Dawson before we go to Mr. Smith? Uh, Councillor Harder, do you have a question for Mr. Dawson? Yes, I do. Um, well, actually, no, I'll hold off and, and ask uh, uh, of the um, of staff. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dawson. And we'll go to Mr. Smith, Mr. Burke Smith. Mr. Smith, are you with us? Yeah, it's under Margaret Smith. He's there, uh, Chair. So he's on mute. Can you unmute him, Mark? So can I can't. He has to do it himself. But uh... Mr. Smith, can you hit the button? 
mute so you can unmute yourself. Mr. Smith, can you hear us? I know if you can't um, if you can't get on to speak, I do know that the issue is uh, similar in nature to to Mr. Dawson um, in terms of a compensation issue through the the fall. Oh, maybe maybe we'll go to Councillor Harder to ask uh, staff. We have Dave Ryan uh, staff to speak about the, the report, and then we'll keep trying to see if Mr. Smith uh, just so we. Uh, We'll hear from him just for the for our record. So, uh, yeah. Councillor Harder, if you have a question for Mr. Ryan, we have Dave Ryan. Yeah, I was actually sending a text to Councillor Moffat, who knows more about drains than anybody that I know uh, that's ever been on council. Uh, but I didn't get a chance to because you're asking me. But I mean, is it our role? And I don't know this. Is it our role to agree that this is a fair price, or are we dealing with no, it's not. So Councillor Moffat saying not. And and what is the process then that they would have to uh, make that argument after after we we agree, if we agree or we, we disagree? Why don't we turn to Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan? Yeah, so the, the uh, allowances are determined by the drainage engineer and he's on the call as well, so we can explain further. But it's based on the impact assessment. It's not based on market value. So there is a formula that they use. This is the opportunity for the landowners to, to raise this issue. Uh, if they decide through the drainage act process that they disagree with the decision of committee or council, there are appeal processes available to them. Uh, but this is where these issues are to be raised. But if Mr. Robinson is on the line, I would ask him just to explain how we came up with these allowances. And just to explain the allowances is for loss of any land or crops due to the, the, uh, the construction or the improvement of the drain. Uh, the drain is a communal drain. It's not owned by the city. The farmers petitioned for it back in the day. It's their drain. Uh, there are improvements being made to the drain, the existing drain. But with that, I'll let uh, Mr. Robinson explain further on how he came up with those uh, those assessments, allowances, rather. And you there? Robinson, Robinson. I'm here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, yeah, this... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain the, the process we use or how we come up with this, but also I'll refer to a document that's uh, a guide for engineers working under the Drainage Act, publication 852, which came out in, uh, in uh, late 2018. But basically it, it captures what we have been doing. And it, essentially what it says about the value of allowances the allowances must be fair to the property owners that receive them, but also fair to the other property owners in the watershed that are contributing to the payment of the allowances. <clears throat> so as Mr. Ryan has indicated, we have used the impact uh, property assessment values, uh, well, literally in all the drains we do in, in Ottawa and Eastern Ontario because it is, it's something that's, that is there and from our point of view is, is defensible and that we're not, we're not trying to uh, create a number or pick a number that may or may not be different. Now, you know, and, and in this case, what we have used is the value, the impact value from March 2020, which was the most current at the time we did the report. So that we have used that uh, throughout the, the area for all of the properties where there is land being taken. So I, I think it's, I, I appreciate that the concerns of the landowners uh, and, you know, we don't have anything firmer in the impact or otherwise, I mean, there may be much land that's there that uh, people would sell if they get the right amount of money. And one of the things around Stittsville, and it, it does happen in other areas near urban areas, there is land that may have been sold uh, in the past that's not classified by impact as 
as farmland, which I'd consider it might be speculative land because of the potential for development. But the bottom line is we've used the impact values. It's a standard practice we use. And in fact, in the same document I re referred to it as one, it's not the only one, but it's definitely one of the recommendations that's made there. So that uh, uh, we, I mean, unless, unless the committee was to give us specific directions to with an amount to be used, there, there isn't much that we can do to change that. We think it's a, a fair approach and a defensible approach. And ultimately, you know, we have to look at this because if it, if it does go to a appeal, then we really, like everything else on the municipal drains, have to be in a position where we can defend the decisions that we have made. Andy, Dave Ryan here again. Could you just highlight how much land we're talking about for these uh, these owners? How much land is affected by this these improvements? It's an existing drain. It's I know there's some widening and a minor relocation, but can you just speak to that, the actual land that's being affected by this, please? Yes. Well, in the case of Mr. Smith, and I happen to have some documentation in front of me on that, it's about 0.9 hectares, and to put. Again, the value that we have used is $17,225 per hectare. Again, that comes from impact. So that the value that will be paid to uh, Mr. Smith is $15,502. Uh, plus there's some additional uh, allowances for spreading of the material, which again, there's a method we use for that. Now, and I'll come to uh, uh, the other property in a minute, but the what we have done in this case of this drain is, is because it was kind of initiated as a result of development in the area, we have assigned a, a very small part of the total cost to the property owners, all of the property owners. And uh, in the case of Mr. Smith's property, again, I happen to have it in front of me, it's, I think his assessment after uh, a grants is about a little over a thousand dollars. So that, and then in essence, what he will do is he'll get a payment of about $25,000, sorry, $29,000 because of the fact that the amount being assessed to lands is fairly low. And I don't think that, that doesn't come into play on how much we think the uh, the allowance should be we again we based it on on uh, the impact values now in the case of Mr Dawson and I don't have the numbers here uh, uh, his area that is involved is I think it's 0 0.33 hectares so it, it it's uh, again this it's not in in the case of of Mr. Dawson, because it's a small, the drain goes through a very small part of his property. I think the total property is 1.85 hectares. So again, we've used the same formula as far as calculating how much his allowance is. And then in addition, he's also getting an allowance. We're not spreading the material on his property because it's uh, the drain is being relocated off of the road allowance. And the reason it's being relocated off the road allowance is that in that area, the ditch, the roadside ditch, which is also the municipal drain, is uh, up to three meters deep and it's a safety hazard. So uh, I, again, because of the fact that the, uh, there isn't a lot of uh, charge back to the individual property owners, Mr. Dawson will get a fairly significant uh, payment directly. Often the, the allowances go towards balancing off or or reducing the amount of money that a landowner has to pay, but to say in this case, because most of the uh, most of the cost is being charged to the city for the relocation and to the upstream development areas for uh, for the major part of the costs. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Robinson, and I think uh, this process uh, has been there for a good reason. We we'll follow impact, but. Uh, uh, Councillor Harder, do you have any follow-up question or do you get the answer you're looking for? Yes, I think uh, it's about as clear as mud. 
but it's a lot clearer than it was before. And now it's only murky. Thank you. I mean, okay. Uh, again, uh, the, the policy is to follow impact and impact. That's how they value the land. I, I understand that dilemma because the, the land is agriculture uh, land and farmland and, and valued separately if it lands going to be in the urban development. So that's, I think, the, the misunderstanding. Uh, Councillor Gower, you have a question before we go to Councillor Martin. And, and before we go to Councillor Gower, is Mr. Smith managed to come online? Hello, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Deborah. You have Good five morning minutes and, uh, the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to talk here. Um, my concerns are mainly the same as Mr. Dawson's. This is not... Uh, I would say this is some prime number one agriculture land that we're talking about. And in my calculations, they're going to take 4.2 uh, acres of land from me. And that's something I can't replace. I can't buy at any price from a local area and land in here has been selling for around 20,000 an acre. Um, we figure that that would be a number for us too, but uh, we're not against uh, just digging the original ditch out, de uh, deepen it. This land is, uh, I think on the, on the land map, it is uh, Osgood uh, loam, and it will, no matter whether you dig this ditch wider, it will still cut in, and we will lose more land as years go by. We have just got this ditch uh, kind of settled and got good the sides of it are sticking the way they should be but there is one hang of a volume of water comes down there and it comes at a very fast speed now the last time it was dug out I made them put some rip wrap up on the end of my north end of the farm near Stitzville and a bit of a curve in it as there is a bit of a curve in the road there too at Aikens and uh, and Shea and um, there's got to be something done. If you dig this up again, it's got to be rip wrapped with something or some kind of hydro seeded or because uh, I'm only guessing at this, but I'm sure that water is doing 10, 15 mile an hour when it's coming down there. It's moving because of the great grade that's on that ditch. It's as you get deeper and deeper and in a terrific outlet at the creek, there is no holding it back. But I have never seen the ditch uh, flood like onto our farmland or anybody else's around. It's doing quite an adequate job for the farmers. And I expect this petition was started by uh, uh, some of the rich guys in Stitzville that are building houses. And uh, um, if they were to take 4.2 acres off their subdivision, would they be happy? This land will never be returned to us because uh, the next generation has taken it over, my daughter and her husband. And if you want to figure it on 40 years of farming, that's a lot of food that's not going to be raised. And since this COVID is on us, it seems to be people are getting a little more interested in where their food comes from. And uh, as I say, this is, this is number one ag land. This is not uh, swamp. And uh, so therefore, I think you should take it into consideration that we, we should be compensated better. And on top of that, the price of crops have gone uh, right through the roof. This morning, uh, uh, the Chicago Board of Trade, trade uh, corn prices are uh, 277 a ton. And we normally get four and a half ton to the acre on this good land. And uh, soybeans is... Uh, 678 a ton and uh, you know we get a ton and a half sometimes better so uh, if we're going to have this land tramped on and um, earth piled on it and uh, the subsoil from down in the ditch piled up on our on top of what we're topsoil what we're trying to grow our for crops on we need more compensation for that one minute pardon one minute. Oh, um, so I think uh, I know you have uh, formulas and things that you work this all on, but 
I think we better get into the real, uh, join the real life here because um, what I tell you is the truth. And uh, I don't know how EPAC comes up with these numbers, but it's not this area at all. And uh, therefore, uh, I hope uh, I've enlightened you a little on what's, what the real world is and uh, and thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And I'm glad we managed to get you back uh, to speak. Uh, any question for Mr. Smith before we go to the list? No? Okay. So uh, uh, the list is uh, Vice Chair Goward and Councillor Moffitt and Councillor Meehan. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Dawson and Mr. Smith for your presentations. I, I have a question for staff. On page three of the report, there's a line that an, an assessment for special benefit is also assigned to the future development lands in block 17D. Uh, I'd like you to clarify where is block 17D and what legal mechanism do you use to um, assign those special benefits? How does that work? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Andy, are you still there? Can you uh, speak to your, uh, your report on that, please? Yes, I'm here and I'd be happy to do so. Yes, the, uh, I had uh, my, my report open at the, at the page where the cost estimates are, but I, I was looking at something else. But the majority of the, of the cost, as I indicated, is there's a portion, the lower end where we're relocating it on Mr. Dawson's land, that because it's being located um, to, to give a better, safer situation for the road, we've assigned that as a special benefit to the city. And Andy, and, sorry, Andy, it's Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith's land is where the relocation's happening. Oh, no, it's Mr. Dawson's. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Go. Uh, sorry, that's okay. <clears throat> Um, we, there is a presentation if we want to put it up later, but uh, um, so in that regard, there's a, a special provision in the case of the lands that are being developed in Stittsville, I think there's 17A, B and D, and then there's, there's 20 E, F and H, if I have them, which are the, the 17s are south of Fernbank, the, the 20s are north of Fernbank, is that we've assigned a special benefit of a, you know, a significant part of the cost to them. And there is provision within the drainage act to do this. So it's not, a, it's not an uncommon thing where there's a, a, a benefit, of, a special benefit to particular properties. And you know, to, to a large extent, this, uh, was initiated by the development that's taking place in the in the village, as well as the desire of the road authority to to move the drain off the road. So, so that's it's, it's a provision within the drainage act. Just for clarification, in Mr. Smith's case, is that the 0.9 hectares that is being uh, allowed for for basically payment for the use of the the land and not where it's being spread works out to be about 2.2 acres. I guess for clarity, what I'm asking is we're assigning special benefit with, to future development lands in block 17D. Uh, are these lands that are already in the urban boundary or are they lands that are in the potential urban boundary discussion that we're having right now? Um, what if these lands never de developed? Does that mean the, the, the city would just never be paid back for that portion of this drainage work? No, those lands are presently within the, uh, the development area that was proved last time around. Okay, thank you. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. And I might just add also, although it doesn't have to uh, it's not a requirement because under the drainage act we kind of do the assessment but i think in uh, most instances the requirement to to pay a portion of the cost is included within the subdivision agreements as well so. thank you 
that it, Mr. Vice Chair? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Moffitt? Uh, thank you, thank you. Just saying, um, Mr. Smith is somewhat right. There's the, this all stems, the Faulkner drain, the report that we have before stems from development in the area six lands in Stittsville area. Interestingly enough, there's actually a stormwater pond that is not in the urban area. It was actually shifted outside the urban area into the rural area, which equates for just around five acres of land um, so that it wasn't included in the urban area for development purposes. Um, so the, the, the drain, that, that stormwater pond feeds into the Faulkner drain, which then runs through and requires the, the upgrades to the system here. And this is, this is common. Most of the drainage work we've been doing in the last, at least the last 10 years, um, have been updates due to the impact of development. And just in this area alone, uh, Monaghan drain, uh, Arbuckle drain and the Van Gaal drain have all been, have all stemmed from development activities. Um, so in this case, one of the things, so in terms of cost, you know, we, when we sit as court revision, do you have the ability to work within the, the assessments that are assigned uh, through the schedules in the, in the drainage report? Uh, right now, what I would suggest, and this is, uh, there's, there's a couple of things at play one is the notification. So we, um, both Mr. Doss and Mr. Smith uh, didn't get notified as quickly as we would have liked. Uh, with Canada Post challenges we've had, the notifications were sent out uh, about 30 days ago, uh, but they only just received them recently. So in, in a case like this, we would have preferred that they had the opportunity to speak with the engineer a bit more uh, prior to today before coming to here. Uh, so one of the options that we have is actually taking these comments from both Mr. Dawson and Mr. Smith and then referring the report back to uh, back to the engineer uh, so that they can further evaluate this and actually have further discussions with uh, both these landowners uh, before the report then comes back to us. I think that would be wise in order to, you know, not manage things on the fly here with this report uh, and then give the opportunity uh, to both Mr. Dawson and Mr. Smith to further discuss this with the engineer um, and then hopefully have a you know, we'll, we'll then have a better full picture of this when it comes back to us for a, for a decision. And then should future issues do, should future concerns arise still, there are those, those appeal mechanisms in the drainage act process, which include quarter revision, which is us. Uh, and then also through the drainage tribunal and referee, if, if it came to that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Moffitt. We'll go to Councillor Meehan, then we'll come back to uh, the report. Councillor Meehan. Uh, thanks, Chair. I do like Councillor Moffat's suggestion on this. Um, I don't think we should rush it. Um, just uh, you talked about a, a tribunal, Councillor um, Moffat. Uh, is there, like if we were to permit this uh, today, is there a, an appeals process? Is that the, the um, tribunal you were talking about? Yes, there is an, uh, I see with David Ryan, but under section 57 of the Drainage Act, they were allowed to, uh, to, uh, to come to the court provision for appeal. But what, what Councilor Moffin making reference to, since the two residents didn't get a proper notification, we should allow more time uh, to go back to, to, the, to the engineer, Mr. Robinson, and hopefully they can come up with something. Otherwise, we'll come back to us with some recommendation for court provision or other. Am I correct, Mr. Ryan? That's correct, Mr. Chair, yes. Okay, so, so, um, good, thank you. I appreciate that, okay. Now, I think uh, Councillor Moffat is right. I think in discussion with Mr. Ryan uh, last evening, uh, that would be the proper way to, to go forward. So, so we have a report, a three, that the, the committee recommended the council adopt. So we're gonna uh, change that and we're gonna see uh, uh, Mr. Ryan, how, how much time do you need to come back, or Mr. Robinson at this point, uh, tell us how much time do you need to come back to us uh, next next Iraq meeting or maybe further down? I'm, I'm just trying, I don't want to put a pressure on and but yeah. I'd like to, to give an opportunity for staff, engineers and residents to work together. So Mr. Chair, we were anticipating that if it, <clears throat> excuse me, if it was referred back that we would come back to committee in April. In April. Okay, uh, Mr. Dawson, Mr. Smith, I hope uh, you, you're still there listening to us. So uh, this report will come back in April. In the meantime, I think uh, our staff will be in touch with you and Mr. Robinson, the engineer on the report. So uh, 
on a defer k we can defer oh, that so just to be clear it's not a deferral we have to so motion would have to be put forward to refer the report back to the the yeah. drainage engineer correct okay and we'll come back to us in in april is and presumably that's a plenty of time for you mr robinson or enough time for you uh, uh, yes it is and and now i appreciate in the case of mr dawson that he literally just got this yesterday so it's unfortunate now, in the case of Mr. Smith, we've had several discussions with him and has provided more information so that just to be clear. But the other thing is, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, unless there's some direction from this committee to, to use a different way of evaluating the lands, I don't really see that we're going to be able to do very much in that regard, because again, we've use this standard impact information. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we'll look at, of course, I'm just sort of being upfront. I, I, I don't know that there's a lot of room without some additional direction from the committee. Maybe the direction to our staff to tell us what's best practice. Like, I mean, we must have a best practice in the province, how, how other area, uh, in the province or other municipality? Do they use impact or would they use market value? I mean, it's gotta be uh, some practice out there we can benefit from it. And uh, Thomas says we didn't ask you folks if you need a presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if that would have helped, but I mean, we did, staff did have presentation for today, but if we are waiting till April, maybe in April we'll do a presentation to put it in a little bit more contact. But Mr. Uh, Ryan, is there's a best practice in the province about uh, compensation? Can you bring us that up uh, with your report in April? Tell us how other municipality do best practice. Absolutely, Chair. So Mr. Robinson alluded to it. There's a guide for engineers under the Drainage Act in the province, a provincial guide that gives them guidance on how to do these. And to Andy's earlier comments, it is based on the impact assessments. Not It's not speculative on market value. So it has to be based on something concrete so they're based on the impact as a set of property assessment values okay uh councillor harder i see you had your hand up yeah i'm just i'm confused it sounds to me like there's a process in ontario that's being followed here um i don't think that anything that we wait till april um to come up with um as a committee or as a council is going to change that unless there is an opportunity uh gentlemen to uh gentlemen being the gentlemen that actually are being paid by the city not the gentlemen who are farming the land for the two of you the system we follow is it the system that ontario dictates i mean aside from the mpac i mean i get what uh what our um our um farmers are saying i mean their land is likely worth a lot more than impact. That's, that, that's an un, unfortunate and painful fact that impact, while it's better than it used to be, and it's you know um, um, working faster than they used to be. But for example, um, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, with the BIAs, that's an example. All the new businesses that we have here in Barhaven, uh, not many of them are, uh, are, are giving us, uh, are contributing to our, our tax base and that because MPAC hasn't added to it. So they will and we'll catch up with it. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. obviously the MPAC would definitely not have caught up with the, with the increase in the, in the affordability of land in our city. We hear that from everybody, how, how uh, we've run our, our, we don't have affordability anywhere in the city. Um, and uh, we heard that as recently as from Jason McDonald last, last week at our joint committee. So I don't, unless they can tell me or tell all of us that there's an opportunity for us as an individual city to change that, um, I think maybe a direction might be better and allow the gentleman to do what they, what they want to do, which is go to the appeal process. So can we have, do either of you know that for a fact? Well, first of all, I think we need to we need to defer this item because one of the one of the gentlemen didn't notice about this meeting till yesterday, 
and under Section 57 of the Drainage Act, they should have been notified before. Now, for whatever reason, kind of the post or other, they were not notified. But I think that, you know, on the process itself, obviously, uh, Mr. Robinson followed the process being set up by the by the guide. But they, if any changes, uh, yeah, the municipality can make their own changes. But I don't think we're, we are able to do changes right now on the fly regardless. So I think we, we still should wait and we should hear more from our staff what other uh, municipality use for best practices. Council well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I didn't know that piece of information, so I appreciate it. Thanks. Councilor Muff. Thanks. I would simply add that I know there's some, some concerns or discrepancy between the market value and the impact value. One thing of consideration that, that probably wouldn't have been an issue here today had it not been for COVID, is that the impact assessments that we're dealing with are from 2016. They're quite outdated. That was supposed to get reviewed and, and, and completed in 2020, but was pushed off to 2021. So we're dealing with five-year-old assessments, and that's not the norm um, in this province, is to have assessments that old. Normally, these would have been updated by now, and we'd be working on updated assessments. So if we could, you know, I'm, it, it is possible that we could, we could you know, talk in the meantime with impact, see if they have some information that could be pertinent to this discussion that could give us a bit more uh, direction on how we could properly assess these lands. I get the challenge with market value, uh, but I think there is there is something that we should do because the discrepancy between market value and the assessment of these lands is quite, quite severe. And that's after 2016 had a massive increase in assessed value of farmland over the 2012 assessed value. So, so that's the more reason we shouldn't make a decision today and we should wait and see if we can find more, even if reach out to MPAC and do yeah. you know site visit or something. So another good reason why we should uh, defer this item till, uh, till April meeting. And Mr. Ryan, you keep us posted. Even if you need to take a little bit more time in to May, I, I think we should be able to give you a, a space to, to try to give us as much information. And maybe next time you give us a presentation because uh, I feel we missed on the presentation. It could have helped us to understand better. Yeah, that's certainly Mr. Chair. There is a presentation prepared currently, but yeah, I'd certainly be updated for the uh, the next time we come to Iraq. Okay. Chair, there is a um, there is a motion ready to defer if you wish to have it up. Okay, so uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you wanna can you see it, or do you want me to read it? I'd be happy to read it. Uh, therefore, be it resolved that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee refer the report back to the Drainage Engineer under Section 57 of the Drainage Act for reconsideration in response to landowner comments and report back to the April ARAC meeting. Okay. On the motion, Carrie. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Robinson and uh, Mr. Ryan for uh, helping on, and Mr. Dawson and Mr. Smith. Thank you both uh, for attending today's committee meeting. With that, now we go to uh, uh, we have uh, open mic session, and we have two people signed up to uh, to the open mic session. Since we haven't had an open mic for quite some time, we can just open mic, we can just hear what the, our resident have to say without any comment or uh, any uh, back and forth. So uh, the first person is uh, Mr. Ken Holm, Ottawa official plan, rural lands, and he has the power presentation. So Mr. Holm, I hope uh, you're still with us and you have five minutes to address the committee through open mic session. See Mr. Home on the screen. Mr. Home, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. There you mm -hmm. are. Okay. Now we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Are we ready? Uh, no. Are we ready to start? Yes, yes sir. Ken. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is Ken Holmes and I'm one of the two rural members of the city's official plan ambassadors working group. Uh, we help engage the rural community in the development of the plan. Uh, next slide, please. The official plan is supposed to guide growth and manage change to 2046. But rural transportation and the internet are two areas of major deficiency in the current 
uh, plan. Unfortunately, the current draft plan fails to provide guidance in both transportation and the internet. Next slide. No, sorry, back there we go. No, sorry, back. My, my error, back one. There we go. No, back one. That's it, thank you. This quotation might have given optimism that the plan would address these deficiencies, but any optimism is soon dashed when the plan itself is studied. A rural internet, that one sentence, is the single appearance of the word internet amongst 264 pages. For rural transportation, the draft plan lacks vision and direction. Next slide. Looking first at transportation, an overarching goal of the plan is to have half of all trips made by sustainable transportation. That's a very aspirational goal. An aspirational goals are what we need in a plan that has a 30 year vision. Unfortunately, the plan failed to recognize the special challenges that this big move faces in our rural areas. There's a need for transportation options in rural Ottawa. We talk a lot of this deficiency, but have seen a little advance in planning since amalgamation. Next slide. Thank you. There is significant and growing interest among residents in finding some solutions. A recent example is a survey conducted by the Huntley Community Association. That survey focused on the needs of CARP and drew responses from some 240 residences, residents across all age groups. Another study is being undertaken by a community-based group, the Rural Transportation Solutions for Ottawa. They're working to engage residents across rural Ottawa and we'll be seeking counselors input to a survey as well as help engaging our rural residents. Their website will go live shortly and they'll be launching their survey this month. Next slide, please. The top two lines are from a, uh, a what we plan to achieve box in the plan. This suggests that planners would be considering the need for transportation options, but they merely state to recognize mobility options within the rural area. Recognizing options does not lead to policy and planning. The rest of the plan does not even follow through with this what we want to achieve statement. Direction on transportation solutions becomes even more elusive with the wording at the bottom of the slide, where it says that the use of personal vehicles is the most prevalent means of transportation within and to and from the rural area. That's simply a statement of the status quo, but a telling illustration of the lack of vision for rural transportation. Next slide. The official plan is guilty of a common fault that CUTA identifies where transportation planners focus on managing their transportation system and not solving transportation problems. One this minute. paradigm has been evident for the rural area since amalgamation. If the official plan is to shape the future, it must include a bold statement on where we want to progress in the rural area. Next slide, please. Moving to the internet, the avoidance of this problem area is evident by this sentence being the solitary appearance of the word internet in this entire plan. Nowhere else is there even mention of how the shortfall in internet capacity affects rural residents across all areas of quality of life and business. Next slide. I don't think the city has had a plan for resolving our internet problem since the 2007 partnership with ExploreNet. According to a press release at the time, this project would provide 100% rural broadband coverage to rural residents and business. <coughs> now more than a decade later, 
The Ottawa Neighborhood Equity Index reports that rural internet speeds are on average one-tenth of that okay. of urban speeds. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Well, we have to cut it at this point, Mr. Holmes. We've been over your time, but uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I hope you uh, you heard my presentation earlier about uh, rural broadband. But uh, thank you for taking the time to address the committee. Our next uh, guest for open mic session is uh, uh, Peter Hume and Peter Osmonds. I hope I said it right. Uh, uh, power, also they have a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, Mr. Hume, are you on? Oh, here you are. I am. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of, uh, of committee. Um, I was uh, very interested in the AMO presentation to, uh, as, the, as the former president of, uh, of the group, it's uh, heartening to see that it's still making inroads in uh, and bringing up issues that are important to uh, everyone in, in Ontario. Um, I don't know if Mr. Hoosman is, uh, is with us. He had a, a medical issue that he had to deal with, so he, he might not be uh, on the, the line with us, but um, he and I are here um, to seek some clarity from you um, on the, the policy, in, uh, on your policy intent with respect to uh, farm retirement lots. Um, we've come up uh, against um, an issue that we think is, is nuanced and that, um, that your intent, we need to understand what your intent as, uh, as policy setters was in the in the case that we're um, that uh, we're going to show you here. Um, this is uh, the the area outlined in red. If you can see the, the large square, um, is a farm on Frank Kenny Road. It's uh, 4431 and 4439 um, Frank Kenny uh, Road, and it's the Dugas family farm. And you may know uh, the the Dugas fa family. They're uh, long standing. Uh, residents in uh, in the Navin area. I think the city even named a park after um, after them. In 1985, the farm was established, and in 1985, two homes were built in the, on uh, the the farm property: um, a house for Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Dugas, and a house for their son um, Robert. Um, in uh, 2016, the farm was sold. Uh, the Dugas family retired from farming and it was bought by Peter Hoosman. And you can see the red H's that I'm, that I'm showing you um, are the Hoosman uh, farm properties. Um, the main farm is, is at the top along Hoosman uh, Road. They also own the farm property immediately to um, the, the south of the, of the subject property. So all good, farm sold, Dugas's are, are retiring, but part of the agreement was that the Dugas family could retain the two homes that, the two family homes that were um, on the property. All good, seems reasonable. Uh, unfortunately, um, the city's official plan policy really expects in, in a farm where there are two farm, two houses on farm properties, one to be permanent and one to be temporary. And so when you look at uh, the policy and you apply it, um, it expects, the city's policy expects that the city staffs interprets the farm retirement policy as we're going to remove that, that temporary home. Um, and you can see it in, in this official plan. It's even clearer in the new official plan that that two houses on a farm property, one of them is, is temporary and, and has to go. Unfortunately, what we find ourselves here is with the situation where you actually have two permanent houses um, on the property and that we can show them on the, next, uh, on the next two slides. So, oh no, sorry, this is a slide from 1991, just to give you some perspective on how little the farm has, uh, has changed. So that's the, the farm in, in 1991. I showed you it was established in 19, uh, 85, the two houses were built, and there's 2017. So very, very um, similar. So in all that time, um, none of the none of the properties have uh, have really changed. The farm, the property at the top of the the picture is the is the homestead, 
and the the um, the house at the bottom is uh, Robert Dugas's uh, family home. Who he, he lived in. So if you go to the next one, so the problem we ran into is here are the two houses. If you can just run through them quickly. The problem we ran into is in trying to create two properties for the, the Dugas family, um, we run afoul of the temporary nature of the, of the home. And the only way to achieve a, a farm retirement on this property is to have one of those permanent homes demolished. And in fact, the city, uh, city staff were very clear and they, they were, this is the way they're interpreting the policy. Um, they, they indicated that if Robert Dugas moved from where he lives and where he's lived since 1985 into the Dugas family home at 4431, and then we demolished 4439, we would be able to achieve, uh, uh, we would be able to put that, the house at 4431 into Robert's name and he would be able to, um, to uh, have title to, to that property. That's time. So Mr. Chair, my last, my last thing I will say to the, to the committee is what we're looking for, we don't really believe that the city policy encompasses two existing homes. And so what we're asking the committee to do or to hear us is to uh, ask staff to bring back a report with options on resolving so the unique problems like this um, without having to dare, tear down these, to tear down one of the- Thank the you. Thank you, Mr. Hume uh, for your presentation. You. And uh, uh, obviously we're not gonna comment on this. We'll leave that, uh, uh, we can ask staff after, a, especially on the policy side. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hume, and thank you, Mr. Hume. Uh, for your uh, presentation, uh, both of you. Uh, any inquiries from our colleague, uh, Councillor Moffat? Councillor Moffat, we're not commenting on, on a presentation, are we? Well, in, in normal circumstance, what we can do with the open mic sessions is that we can ask for information from staff. Uh, we can ask staff after to, to give us uh, they, I'm, some of our staff on my call, they heard the presentation, they can report to us later at the time. But uh, in the meantime, we just heard the presentation. I think that's how we did in the mid governing about the open mic. We just listen. And if there's anything take away, we'll come back with staff. Okay. Am I correct, Chris? Uh, do I have legal on the call? Uh, Ms. Inta? Uh, that that is correct, Chair. Um, and uh, I believe, for your information, Mr. Chair, uh, the property that was just spoken about uh, was at the Committee of Adjustment, and the Committee of Adjustment adjudicated on it. And the city is now a party to an appeal in front of the uh, in front of the Alpat. So, just for your information. And that's for an extra reason not to touch something. It's going to be in the front of another. We we don't have jurisdiction over Committee of Adjustment, so. Uh, uh, so we're not going to comment on it, but as far as policy, I think we can have discussion with our staff because we have OP uh, right now we're working on. If we need some clarity on a policy issue, we can check with staff after. But thank you, Ms. Inta. That is correct. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, any inquiries or other business? So before we adjourn, uh, this is the, I believe, uh, if Councillor uh, Support Committee recommendation, that would be uh, last meeting for uh, Councilor Gower, be a vice chair of uh, Iraq. I know uh, Councilor uh, uh, Gower staying uh, on Iraq, and we thank him for that. But I was just want to say, on behalf of the committee and staff, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, for your support, and looking forward working with the new vice chair in the next uh, couple of years. So, uh, with that, I want to say thank you, uh, Councilor Gower, and we really appreciate your uh, support and also staying on Iraq, that's uh, very important to us. Thank you. I'm not sure if you wanna say something before we adjourn. Um, well, it's been a long meeting. My daughters are daring me to sing one last time from the Hamilton soundtrack, but I will, um, <laughs> I will not do that. Thank you for your words, Mr. Chair. And it's been a good learning experience about uh, rural affairs, drains, ditches, severances, and uh, agriculture, internet, everything else that makes up the, uh, diverse world of, uh, of our rural area in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, our next meeting will be Thursday, uh, March 4th, 2021. Thank you very much. 
and have a great day. We are adjourned.